experiments in, in East Africa, which is sponsored by ISSI. I'm Jane Molden, and I am the interim director of ISSI this year. Now, before we begin, I would like to announce two upcoming events sponsored by one of ISSI's centers. Tomorrow at noon in the Duster Conference Room in ISSI, Bernhard Weidinger, who is a visiting scholar with ISSI's Center for Right-Wing Studies, will present a talk based on his current research examining Christian rhetoric in uh, European and American far-right discourses on immigration from 2000 to 2012. And on Thursday, December 5th, which is a little ways away, ISSI's Center for Latino Policy Research will host a talk entitled Multi-Tiered Membership, Citizenship, Membership, and the Political Socialization of the Mexican Im Immigrant Family, presented by Marcela Garcia Castanon, who is Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science at San Francisco State. And this event will be in the Schulp House Conference Room at 2547 Channing Way at 4 o'clock. Um, oh, yes. So would you please turn off your cell phones? And if you haven't signed in, the sign-in sheet is in the back, and we would ex very, very much appreciate your signing in um, since you're here. And today, Professor Miguel will speak for around 45 minutes, at which point we will open things up for questions and comments. And I'd like to introduce... Miguel. He is the Oxfam Professor in Environmental and Resource Economics and Faculty Director of the Center for Effective Global Action in the Department of Economics at UC Berkeley. He earned SB degrees in Economics and Mathematics, is that correct? <laughs> okay. And from MIT, and a PhD in Economics from Harvard, where he was a National Science Foundation Fellow. His main research focus is African economic development, including work on the economic causes and consequences of violence, the impact of ethnic divisions on local collective action, and interactions between health, education, environment, and productivity for the poor. And he has conducted field work in Kenya, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, and India. He is author with Ray Fisman of Economic Gangsters, Corruption, Violence, and the Poverty of Nations, Prince, uh, Princeton, 2008, and author of Africa's Turn, which is from MIT Press in 2009. He is a faculty research association, associate of the NBER and associate editor of the uh, Quarterly Journal of Economics, Journal of Development Economics, and Review of Economics and Statistics. His awards include, among others, the 2012 UC Berkeley uh, Distinguished Teaching Award. So please welcome, join me in welcoming Professor Ted Miguel. Thanks a lot. It's great to be here. Can, can folks hear me okay? Okay. Um, I also want to say that uh, you should feel free to, um, you know, raise your hand if you have a burning question, and I'll, I'll try to uh, answer along the way, um, and then we can take more questions at the end. Uh, this is a, a project with uh, a large number of co-authors with very long names. Um, and uh, one of them is here. Simon Gall is here. He's a PhD student in economics here at Berkeley, but it's a really great team. Uh, Norway, Berkeley, uh, and, and uh, UCLA and Stanford. Uh, folks, uh, it's an interesting group in part because uh, we're pretty interdisciplinary. Dan Posner and Kelly Jang are political scientists. Uh, the, the group in uh, the Norwegian School of Economics are experimental economists. Simon and I are development economists. and. Uh, we decided to work together on a project really at the intersection of these, of these fields. Uh, the uh, issue we're, we're focusing on in this uh, research program is uh, the issue of ethnic divisions and, um, and how they may affect economic and political development. There's a lot of literature on this topic and a number of uh, prominent uh, pieces of research have claimed that high levels of ethnic diversity uh, have actually impeded African development, especially uh, economic growth. There's data uh, that shows that more ethnically diverse African countries have slower economic growth. And that was really the starting point. That was the Easterly and Levine paper in 97, and that was a, the starting point for what is now a huge literature documenting how um, ethnic divisions correlate with low public goods provision. That's, I have some work on that, uh, conflict, um, uh, per the performance of legislators. Um, and uh, this issue has you know, been important across disciplines. Uh, 
uh, a, a very important second question, once we sort of start answering the question about what uh, impacts ethnic divisions may have on development outcomes, an important next question is what can be, what can be done about it? Uh, how can we reconcile uh, highly fragmented societies uh, with um, political stability, political development, and economic development? You know, how can we make these divisions less salient? And um, one particular public policy approach that I'm just going to flag here on, the, on the, the bottom bullet point, but we'll come back to uh, later on, um, uh, is, is, is something as simple as uh, reminding people about the nation and reminding people about the importance of national unity enough to start building bridges across groups. So I just want to flag that because it's a policy approach that's often mentioned, and I'll talk about a specific uh, policy in Kenya recently that, that took this approach um, and, and we'll, we'll try to um, understand in part uh, the kinds of impacts this sort of approach could have. So what do we do to try to grapple with this issue? Well, there's, as I mentioned, a large literature on this topic. My co-authors and I have done basically observational work collecting data from real field settings on, for instance, uh, the relationship between local uh, ethnic diversity in East Africa and public goods provision. Some of my work found a negative relationship between local diversity and school funding, water well maintenance, and, and other public goods. That, a lot, some of that work's been done. We decided to take a different approach and go into the lab and really um, try to, to get at, um, at these issues with a little bit more of a controlled environment, so running lab experiments where we can manipulate the environment uh, and try to better understand what was going on. The overall project, and I'm, I'm really going to focus on the Kenya part today. You see that there's Kenya and Tanzania here. I'm mainly going to focus on Kenya uh, today. But the overall project ran similar lab experiments that sought to measure the degree of cooperation between different individuals across ethnic lines in some of the experiments um, in both Kenya and Tanzania. Kenya and Tanzania are interesting countries to look at for these issues because despite their proximity and despite their British colonial heritage and, and other commonalities, they've, they're seen as uh, having a very different uh, set of ethnic policies and nation-building policies since independence, uh, where Tanzania is thought to be the country that's arguably had the most concerted and consistent nation-building policies in sub-Saharan Africa uh, through the promotion of uh, common language, Swahili, through reform of the educational system, through the abolition of tribal chiefs immediately upon independence, whereas Kenya has taken sort of the opposite route where chiefs remain influential, uh, where there's been much less emphasis on Swahili as a, as a common national language, et cetera. So um, we wanted to contrast these two uh, settings. Uh, and we were also very interested in uh, not just ethnic cooperation sort of in general or in the abstract, we were very interested in, in ethnic cooperation and ethnic divisions um, at election time. So in the process of when political competition is active, uh, the question is, do ethnic divisions get activated? And we, we, were, um, we set up these, these two labs in Kenya, one uh, last summer and then one early uh, this year, um, based on the timing of a Kenyan national election. So there was a Kenyan national election in March of 2013. We ran one lab in the weeks before the election to really capture behavior in a setting of intense political competition. It was an incredibly close election this year in Kenya settled by only a few percent and, and quite contentious uh, with some controversy around the vote count as it happened in the previous election. Um, the previous lab in 2012 occurred eight months before the election in really a pre-election period. So we wanted to see if behavior or inter-ethnic cooperation changed over time uh, in a way that we could capture in the lab. And um, in addition to taking advantage of these differences across space with Kenya and Tanzania and then across time with the two Kenyan labs, we wanted to experimentally uh, manipulate the, the environment by using priming. So probably many of you are familiar with priming, maybe some aren't, but uh, priming in the lab is an attempt to, you could think of it as getting people in a certain mind frame, getting people uh, really activating certain latent views or um, really getting people in a certain mindset. So we did that by uh, randomly uh, generating different primes for different subjects in the lab, some which were meant to accentuate uh, a feeling of political competition. So you know, that was sort of a parallel to 
comparing the first round in Kenya to the second round in Kenya, some that were meant to uh, emphasize a strong national identity and national pride. That was meant to stimulate a mindset that maybe contrasted Kenya versus Tanzania. So we tried to have the lab mimic our real world design. And that was, uh, that was one of the goals here. I'm going to focus on Kenya both because of length. Um, there's a lot of subjects, a lot of different tests. I wouldn't get through all of them, but if later in the talk or in the question answer period folks are interested in Tanzania, I can give you the, the broad outline of the contrast there. There's plenty just between these two Kenya rounds that, uh, that I'll focus on today. So um, I briefly mentioned uh, that there had been an election in Kenya uh, earlier this year. The, in the previous election, the December 2007 election, um, that was also a very hotly contested election. All Kenyan elections uh, since the return to multi-party rule and even before uh, the, the, the dictatorship, before one-party rule, so back in the 60s, all elections were really contested along ethnic lines in Kenya. So political parties had very strong ethnic affiliations. Um, this, this election was no different. The 2007 election was no different. The, the 2007 election was very controversial because exit polls showed Raila Odinga, the opposition candidate, uh, winning. Um, but the official election tally showed the incumbent, Mwai Kibaki, uh, winning. And I think the consensus among observers was that Odinga won, uh, but that the election was stolen uh, by Kibaki. Um, and the, the rigging of the election set off uh, about a month of ethnic violence, and then it sort of tailed off for another month or two until, until peace was at hand, uh, peace was, was uh, achieved. Um, thousands were killed. Hundreds of thousands were displaced from their homes. It was a cataclysmic event. Uh, for Kenya, and the feeling was Kenya was really on the verge of civil war at that point. There were basically ethnic militias being armed, uh, and being armed with the assistance of high-level political figures, and that's why there are multiple Kenyan political leaders, including the current Kenyan president, Uhuru Kenyatta, who are under indictment at the International Criminal Court for arming these different ethnic militias that were fighting mainly in Rift Valley and some in, in Central Province. So um, that's, the, that's the backdrop. This is a, a picture of someone, uh, the Kenyan flag in the foreground, and a very angry person after the 2007 election. Um, what happened after 2007, 2008 um, was actually very interesting. There was a recognition that Kenya had sort of looked, over, uh, looked into the abyss, and there were several different attempts in the subsequent years to try to build a feeling of greater national unity and to try to dampen ethnic divides. Some were government efforts, so there was a new government com uh, commission, uh, the National Cohesion and Integration Commission, set up that put billboards over Nairobi and the other cities, put radio ads on, trying to emphasize uh, the importance of Kenyan identity and, and really downplay ethnic divisions. There was a civil society effort, the Mukenya Daima, meaning Kenyan forever, uh, in Swahili effort uh, as well, and um, several high-level political leaders and religious leaders you know, joined in um, these calls. So um, when we started this experimental project in the lab, um, a subgroup of the, of the many co-authors, uh, including myself, were discussing actually doing a campaign of this sort ourselves using SMS texts. So we were thinking about in the you know, run-up to the campaign, sending out texts to diverse areas with unity messages, hoping that that would be an interesting and positive uh, intervention, but also we were interested in trying to study the impact of that uh, in terms of maybe election violence or, uh, or other incidents. I'll talk more about that, that intervention, which never happened later on, and I'll tell you why it, never, why it never happened. So what do we do in particular? We ran lab experiments. We ran two very standard lab experiments, and the advantage of doing this is we know how to run them, we know how to compare them across settings, one is the dictator game and one is the public good game. Uh, the dictator game uh, is a game where there's a pie. There's two players in the game. One is passive, one is active. Player one is active. There's a pie that player one needs to split between player one and player two. That's the game. So I'm given 100 shillings and I'm asked, how much do you want to keep? How much do you want to give to player two? And critically here, player two is anonymous. So I don't know who player two is. They can't figure out who I am. Um, Neoclassical economic theory would suggest player one would take all 100 shillings because, you know, who's this other person? I don't know them. I'm not going to benefit from them getting the money. I should keep all the money. In reality, when these games are played around the world, somewhere between usually 20 to 40 percent of the pie is shared, even though I'm just sharing it with someone I'll never meet. So there's quite a bit of altruism that comes through in these games. And 
this game is really used as a tool to measure altruism, to measure this kind of anonymous generosity towards someone else in your society, or of course you could play with someone far away who's not in your society. That's one game. The second game is the public good game. In the public good game, there are three players, all of which need to decide how much of their pie to put into a common pot. Whatever's put in the common pot is then multiplied and then shared among the players. So the way these games are typically set up is to create a tension between what's good for me and what's good for the group as a whole. So of course, for the group as a whole, the best thing to do is for all of us to put all our money in the pot, get it multiplied, and then share it back. That creates the biggest pie for everybody. But you can create a game, and this is what we do, which is a standard way to do it, where for every dollar I put in, that dollar is doubled, but then divided among three players. So for every dollar I put in, I get two divided by three dollars. I'm losing a third of a dollar. So this is a measure of my willingness to sacrifice for the public good. That's why it's called a public good game. So um, those are two standard games which are really used to measure altruism, cooperation, and a willingness to contribute to the collective good. There's a third game we developed called the Choose Your Dictator game, which builds on the dictator game. Uh, in the Choose Your Dictator game, I get to choose between two different individuals as my dictator, and then they become the dictator and have full authority to allocate a pie between me and them. And what we do here is we provide information about the ethnic affiliation of different individuals and see if players tend to choose someone from their co-ethnic group as their dictator. We also vary the information that the dictator has about me. Sometimes the dictator knows I'm their co-ethnic, sometimes they don't. And it, the, the, the sort of permutation we're most interested in is if the dictator knows my ethnicity and I know theirs, am I more likely to choose them thinking they're gonna be better to me than a non-co-ethnic? So it's sort of a measure of trust between anonymous Co-ethnics. Okay, so these are the games that we play. Um, and as I mentioned already, uh, we play these games across time in Kenya, across space in East Africa, to try to understand the role that nation building across Kenya and Tanzania play, which I'm not gonna emphasize as much today, but in particular, emphasizing how proximity to a political, uh, a, a very politically uh, competitive period um, plays. In some previous work, uh, Eifert, uh, myself, and Dan Posner uh, used survey data from the Afrobarometer surveys to try to understand what happens to ethnic attitudes close to elections in Africa. And we found that within about six months, or especially four months, three months, the closer you get to an election, the more people's ethnic identity is salient to them. So in the Afrobarometer, people are given uh, a chance to answer a question about what aspect of their identity is most important to them. Is it gender? Is it class? Is it occupation? Is it region? Is it ethnicity? And close to elections across something like 16 African countries, close to elections, people are much more likely to say ethnicity. So there's something about a, politically, uh, a, poli a period of political competition in a new African democracy that tends to bring up feelings of ethnic identity in survey data. Our question was, does it happen in the lab when real money's on the line? Because in all these games we're playing, when you allocate money between yourself and somebody else, you get to keep the money. Real, there's real money on the line. So instead of just talking about ethnic identity and how that changes close to elections, does actual behavior change? So what are some important elements of the study before I get into more of the details? We were uh, lucky to have good field teams and good lab settings, which I'll show you. So we had quite large labs. A lot of experimental labs have, you know, a couple hundred people. Each of our three labs, the two in Kenya and the one in Tanzania, has six to seven hundred subjects. So uh, we have good representation across different ethnic groups, gender, um, and this allows us to do some subgroup analysis to be powered statistically to do some subgroup analysis that we wouldn't be able to do if we'd had a hundred subjects, for instance. Um, the subjects are drawn from working class areas in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, what people often call slum areas. Um, including the largest slum in Nairobi, Kibera, as well as Viwandani. Different slums often have different ethnic compositions, so to get a good cross-section ethnically, we worked in two, we drew subjects from two different slums. Um, as I mentioned, we primed different types of identity or different mindsets, and we did this using a standard, uh, standardized set of closed-end questions that were interspersed throughout the lab to kind of keep the priming up throughout the lab. So in dribs and drabs, these questions came through. To try to understand what was going on with the primes, we also em employed implicit association tests. 
So those of you who work in psychology or, or in some other fields, these are used in political science as well, um, you uh, will be familiar with these implicit association tests really measure, you could think of it as subconscious biases or subconscious tendencies. And our question is when we prime people in a certain way, do we see certain biases get accentuated uh, as measured uh, through the IAT? Finally, a last point is uh, we did something that's increasingly common in, in development economics and now also in political science and some other fields. We wrote a pre-analysis plan. So before we touched the data, we wrote down all the analysis we would do, all the econometric and statistical tests we would run. As I'll talk about later, there's a lot of different priming treatments and games and subgroups. And when you put it all together, the risk of data mining in this setting is just huge. And we wanted to really tie our hands and also just give the results more credibility. And I'll, I'll talk more about how we did that. So um, that's the setup. But what are the questions? I've already alluded to them. There are three main questions I'm going to give you answers to uh, today or try to give you answers to. This is, this is quite a new paper. We, we only got all the data together in the last, uh, uh, last few months. And we presented it a couple times. First, what is the degree of co-ethnic preference in the lab? So we know ethnic politics are important in Kenya. We know there's ethnic violence. But when you put people in the lab to make these economic decisions in terms of dividing a pie or contributing to the public good, do we measure uh, co-ethnic preference, one. Two, how does behavior change in an election period? How does overall altruism change? And in particular, how does the degree of co-ethnic preference change? We've already hypothesized based on the survey evidence from our own previous work, and I think it seems kind of intuitive that close to, to an election, when ethnic identities are more salient, maybe ethnic divisions will manifest themselves in less sharing with non-co-ethnics in the lab. Third, how does behavior change with different types of priming? And you know, again, you could think of priming as getting people in a mindset that sort of mimics a real world situation, or maybe priming is a little bit like those public service messages that are going on on the radio or the billboards that are, that are being thrown out there to try to build national unity. If you're kind of pinged with these messages, how does your behavior change, if at all? So there is a potential public policy link to the third point. Of course, this, these are lab primes, and they're not meant to be the same as a real-world intervention, but I think there is um, some connection there. So... Uh, these are the two labs. The one on the left is the lab in Nairobi. It's really a great state-of-the-art lab that was set up. It's a permanent lab set up by researchers. There have now been a couple dozen studies in the last few years done in this lab. They have touchscreen monitors, earphones. Everything's narrated in Swahili on the earphones. Uh, the, the screens are really clear. I'll show you a screen in a second. There are Kenyan staff who speak not just English and Swahili, but all the major uh, ethnic uh, vernaculars on hand to answer questions. It's a real amazing lab, and we were lucky that we could sort of join in and run our, our lab in Nairobi. It also happens to be pretty near Kibera, which is this large slum. So there was actually pretty easy access, really, on just one Matatu line, one uh, public bus line, to get to this lab in, um, uh, in Nairobi. Uh, the Dar es Salaam lab also had touchscreen, also had earphones. It didn't have the, the, the sort of cubicles, but it was also a very good lab, and we tried to make them as comparable as possible um, and tried to draw on similar working class areas, really, in both, in both cities. Um, the population is relatively well educated. There's, uh, if we round up, 10 years of schooling on average among our Kenyan sample. They're pretty young. The average age is in the early 30s. Um, with a range of, you know, from the 20s to the 40s, but basically it's a young adult population, a pretty well-educated urban population. And when we get to the results, I just want you to keep that in mind because they may help us make sense of some of the results. And that was based on the previous uh, comment that Jane had given me in my previous talk, uh, which I thought was a good one. Okay, so um, I mentioned the three games, dictator game, public good game, choose your dictator game, uh, which, which can, captures this different, these different things, willingness to share, willingness to contribute to the public good, and then preference for co-ethnic. This is the, the touch screen. It's a little bit small. It says, uh, you know, you have this amount in shillings, 50 shillings. How much do you give away? And then basically you punch in um, 20 or 15 or 18, whatever, you know, whatever number uh, you want, and you press OK. All the games were explained um, with basically on the screen with recordings and even videos. The public goods game is the most complicated game. 
And this one, for this one, we developed a video. I, I didn't, in some previous talks, I'd put the video on. But basically what the video does is, you know, it says, you know, Weiwei means you, um, Wanachama A and B. These are, you know, just basically group members A and B. Each have six coins. How much do you put in to the pot? Once you put them in the pot, then in the video they get multiplied and then passed back out. So the whole process is explained visually. People were given the opportunity to raise their hands and ask questions to the staff. Our feeling was people really got the games. This wasn't too complicated for them, and the way they play it is pretty similar to the way people play it in other parts of the world. So we didn't have too many concerns uh, about it, but you know, there was the individual basket, the group basket, and um, you know, again, after um, you know, the game is explained, then people are told, you have this many shillings, of course, in Swahili, I, it's translated into English here, how much do you want to contribute to the group basket? So what do we find? I think the summary statistics are useful. So um, in the dictator game, when we look at the dictator game with, well, I'm calling it an anonymous partner here. All the partners are anonymous, but what I'm calling anonymous here means you don't even know the ethnicity or anything about this partner. And we play the, these anonymous games first. In a subsequent round of the games, people were given different types of information about their partner, including their birth district, which very strongly connotes ethnicity. But when I'm saying anonymous here, you just know nothing about this person. It's the first dictator game you're playing. How much do you share? You share about 40%. So that's a, you know, on the upper end of what's normal around the world, but it's, it's in the normal range. Um, and uh, I'll show you a histogram a little later. A lot of people share 50%. There's a lot of people in these games that either give zero. They're like, hey, I'm going to take it all. No, no penalty to me to do so. And there's a lot of people who play 50-50. And uh, here, more people played 50-50. In the public good game, generosity was even more pronounced. 48% uh, of, the, of the pie, of one's individual pie, was shared in the common basket. So that's pretty generous, uh, again. In the choose your dictator game, it was very interesting running these games, because in the piling of these games, um, we initially wrote the game so that you had to choose between a eth co-ethnic and a non-co-ethnic. And so many individuals in the lab were saying, you know, I can't do that, I don't know these people, they're both the same to me, and this happened enough that we included indifferent as an option, like I can't choose between these two. Um, it turns out almost half the sample chooses indifferent, like I don't care, they're both the same to me. Among the remaining half, it's going to turn out there's going to be very little co-ethnic preference. So that's our first hint that uh, co-ethnic preference may not be as strong here as we thought, but I'm going to give you the data on that in a second, but even in this early piloting, we were getting a hint that co-ethnic preference wasn't as stark as, as you might have thought. Okay, so how do we establish co-ethnic preference uh, beyond this, this choose your dictator game? One way uh, we did it, the most important way we did it, was by randomly allocating different individuals to play with either co-ethnics or non-co-ethnics. So in the dictator game, I first played the anonymous games. I don't know anything about this person. But then in the subsequent round of the dictator game, I was told, you are playing with a 27-year-old who has seven years of schooling who's from Mueya district. So you were told three pieces of information, age, education, and birth district. And we chose the birth districts to uh, you know, very strongly connote ethnic uh, identity. So these are basically, you know, districts with 90-something percent uh, ethnic affiliation with one, with one group. And these are real players. So when you're playing the dictator game, you're playing with someone who had played in a previous dictator game round. So these aren't made-up people. There's no deception. Um, when you divide the pie between you and this person, that person gets paid. So, but the allocation of people with different identities was randomized. So you could have gotten somebody with a whole range of different identities. And the question is, if I'm randomly allocated a, a player two in the dictator game who's from my co-ethnic group versus another group, do I play differently? Do I, do I give more to my co-ethnic than my non-co-ethnic? A very similar uh, thing was done in the public goods game where we had two different alignments. Remember, there's three players in the public good game, me and two others. The two others could either both be my co-ethnics or one could be a co-ethnic and one could be a non-co-ethnic. So I'm either playing against a homogeneous co-ethnic group, the three of us, or a mixed group. And again, do I give more when it's a homogeneous co-ethnic group than when one player is from my group and one player is from a different group? So that's how, how it's done. Um, in terms of the priming, we, we piloted these a lot, we struggled a lot with these. 
we didn't want to be too blatant with the priming. I think in general, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah go ahead. About the public good yeah. Thing. Presumably there will be somewhere I'm the only one in my group of my ethnic and the other two are the other ethnic because there are three. Yeah, we didn't do that last one. Yeah, we, we didn't do that one. So we, because of, um, it's not a real group of three. They're previous players and their payout is going to depend on whomever they're randomly matched with, but it's not a physical group of three in the room. Or else you're right, there would have to be logically exactly what you said. But the way the randomization is done with previous players means we don't, we don't do it. We were thinking of having homogeneous, you know, both of the other players are my group, a mixed group, and both are from a different group. But, you know, part of the issue is we just had so many arms and so many sub-games that we cut that one out just to, you know, focus on variation that, that was still meaningful, but um, limited the number of arms. In terms of the priming, in general with priming, you don't want to be too blatant. There's always a concern if you're really blatant with what you're doing and what the goal is of the lab that there'll be some desirability bias, there'll be some response of players to try to play the game the way they're supposed to. I mean, everybody, that, that's a concern everywhere, not just in Kenya or Tanzania. That's true in the U.S. with priming. So the idea was to be subtle. And in the piloting, one thing that we did is throughout the lab, at various points, we stopped the lab in our pilot rounds that aren't in this data, just as we were setting up the games. And we did focus groups asking people, what do you think this whole lab is about? And one thing that was encouraging to us is very rarely did people think it was about ethnicity. People said, well, I think it's about money. I think it's about, you know, figuring out how to save. I think it's about, uh, you know, what to do with my cash or, you know, that came up a lot. And then remember, there were three pieces of information given about the players you were playing with. Education, age, and, and birth district. We didn't even use tribe. We said birth district. An equal number of people in these focus groups thought that the game had something to do with education levels as ethnicity. So we felt like we weren't completely blatant. Go ahead. What were the general age bracket of the person going through this? 20s to 40s. The vast majority are 20 to 40. So they're young adults. 20 to 40s, yeah. Drawn from the slums, Kibera and Viwandani. And basically this, this lab, it's called Busara Lab, had permanent recruiters in these slums going back regularly and enlisting subjects and um, trying to get sort of as broad a pool as they, as they could from those two working class slum areas. In the time frame of the existence of the lab, has there ever been a study based on I think we're the first that had happened so far. When we did the labs, I think we were the first to have this kind of ethnic focus. There were a lot of economic labs and other things, but not with this focus. Now, subsequent to when we're there, I'm not sure if others have done it. One thing I will say, which, is, which helps us out, is they were recruiting enough subjects, and they actually verify identity with finger, with sort of thumbprints to try to make sure they know who's coming to the lab. We got sort of new subjects, and when we did the second round, we don't have any repeat subjects. So the idea is these are all like new people to the lab setting, precisely because of the fear that if you've played previous labs on some topic, you're just going to play differently, you're going to figure out what's going on in the lab, or your previous experience would affect your, your play. So these are sort of new subjects in each round. So that's the best we can do to try to reduce those sort of effects. Okay, so with the, with the, the priming, they were intermi the, the questions people are asked are kind of leading questions. I'll show you some. And they were interspersed between the games. So, you know, how does it work? The political competition priming, which is sort of maybe our focal priming, again, in Kenya, we're interested in what happens when people get in this mindset of political competition. That was the whole goal of doing the two rounds. You know, we asked questions that touched on the degree of political competition, like how many political candidates are running for president? How many candidates are running for mayor? How many MPs are there in Kenya? Things like that to, to make people think about the democratic political system. But we were very careful. We didn't want this to be an explicit ethnic prime. So in the political competition priming, there's no mention of ethnicity. It's just about the political system, number of parties, number of candidates. Now, I'll show you later that just talking about that is going to set off an ethnic bias response in some cases. Because ethnic divisions and political competition are so closely linked in Kenya but we didn't do it explicitly. 
there was a separate, explicit ethnic crime where we were careful not to mention politics. The idea was just to talk about the different languages spoken in Kenya, the different foods spoken in Kenya, the different regional attractions that are you know, the, the pride and joy of different ethnic groups, but no explicit politics. So the idea here is if you talk about ethnic divides, you get sort of a similar reaction to talking about politics because in people's mind, they're sort of one-to-one. -one. The third prime, which again we brought in to kind of mimic this Kenya versus Tanzania difference in mindset was national priming. The goal here was to try to uh, accentuate national pride. So here we asked a question, in your opinion, which is the most beautiful Kenyan flower? And we listed various Kenyan flowers. And another one said, Kenya Airways is a f you know, famous in Africa for um, you know, its, its uh, safety record, et cetera. What are all the different cities that Kenya Airways flies to around Africa? And people got to list those out. Uh, there was a question about all the Olympic medals that had been won by the Kenyan Olympic team, because you know, they're incredibly good at long distance running in Kenya. Okay. So um, that was an attempt to give people a sense of national pride. And then finally, there was a neutral priming. So even the control group got some priming. They, we had to give them you know, questions as well, rather than just dead, dead time. And these were just day-to-day -day questions. So, um, you know, how often do you ride a minibus every week? Which is your favorite cell phone provider? A lot of people in Kenya have two or three different SIM cards. So people have very strong opinions about which cell phone provider is best, and they switch providers. And so these were the kinds of questions that were just like normal everyday conversation items in the control group. So the eight of these questions are interspersed. And the idea is, if you're getting pinged with this sort of reminder throughout the lab, do you play differently? Okay, so um, you know when we think about uh, priming, you know, for instance, national priming, it's it's tricky to try to understand wh what we're doing. So if we remind people of Kenya, maybe they think about all the beauties of you know beautiful Kenyan flowers, but maybe when we have them think about Kenya, they think about the last election and all the election violence. We're not sure exactly what they're thinking about. We're not really sure what the priming is doing. So we conducted implicit association tests just before the second round, where. There was a separate set of subjects brought into the lab, given the priming, and they were uh, asked to do implicit association tests uh, in between the primes. So it was very much mimicking the structure of the lab, but with implicit association tests rather than the economic uh, games. And here the goal is to see if there's some subconscious shifts that are being caused by the primings. So the way the IAT works is response times to particular matching exercises and questions are recorded. And the idea is, if there's a certain answer that you know is the right answer, and you have really no resistance to it, you know, you, you agree with it, there's no cognitive dissonance, you're going to be very quick with your response. But if there's something that you know is the right answer, and you're going to answer the right way, but you hesitate about, maybe you, you have implicit, some implicit bias, maybe there's some implicit, implicit hesitation or, or doubt you have about this answer, you're going to be a fraction of a second slower. So you know, in the U.S., when they try to measure, they, they, they try to measure a racial bias in the U.S. in IATs, folks who have uh, racist uh, views, even if they answer the right answer, even if they're told to answer the right way, basically answer IAT questions a fraction of a second slower than those who don't have racist attitudes. And uh, apparently, it's very hard to game. The idea here is there have even been some studies um, where uh, individuals were told the point of the IAT. They were told this whole, everything I just told you guys. And people were still slower to answer things that they knew they had to answer one way if there was cognitive dissonance. So it's, it's, a hard, it's apparently a hard thing to gain. I'm not a psychologist. We're using this as a tool. But in the existing psychology literature, that's a claim. OK, so what did we do? We had two different IATs, one to measure ethnic bias, one to measure national pride relative to neighboring countries. Um, and what you basically have to do in the ethnic IAT is match the uh, characteristics or names associated with the two largest ethnic groups in the country and in our sample, Kikuyu and Lua, and the two politically relevant ethnic groups as well, to either good or bad attributes. And the question is, even when you know you're going to you know, match, uh, say, Kikuyu to a good, uh, a good characteristic, if I have some bias against Kikuyus, do I do it a bit slower, um, let's say if I'm a Luo? than if I'm a Kikuyu myself. Uh, and then again, the second one was national pride. Let me try to illustrate this um, 
with some examples, but of course our hypothesis here was if we prime people to political competition and ethnicity, we're going to kind of uh, see it come through in the ethnic IAT. They're going to end up showing some more ethnic bias in the IAT. We also thought that if we prime people to nationalism, maybe they'd have less ethnic bias in the IAT and maybe more Kenyan pride in the national IAT. That, those were our like, very straightforward hypotheses. So these are four screens just to illustrate. Uh, individuals have a touch screen, uh, and these are two names. You see Otieno and Chege. Otieno is a, is a Luo name. Everybody in Kenya knows it's a Luo name. So in, in this first exercise, if I see this and I see Otieno, I quickly tick on Luo. That's a Luo name. Chege is a Kikuyu name. Everybody in Kenya knows Chege is a, is a Kikuyu name. If I see Chege, I, kick, I, I click on Kikuyu. These, are, these were the practice screens just to introduce people to the exercise. This is another practice screen. Word association, agony, okay, bad, boom. Should be very quick. Happiness, good, okay. Th these are the practice screens to get people familiar. This is where it starts getting a little more interesting. Karanja is a Kikuyu name. And again, everybody in Kenya will know it's a Kikuyu name. So they should click on, oops, the formatting got screwed up. The bad there should be next to Luo. So let's ignore where it says bad. It says Kikuyu are good on one side and then Luo are bad on the other. Now, of course, the good or bad are irrelevant. It's really just Karanja is a Kikuyu name. The question we ask is, if I'm a Kikuyu, am I faster in associating Karanja with Kikuyu when good is written right under Kikuyu than if I'm a Luo? Do I hesitate by a fraction of a second in putting Karanja next to good? Because Kikuyu and good are next to each other, and I'm, I feel some cognitive distance there. That would be a measure of ethnic bias. The bottom one is Onyango, another Luo name. Here, Onyango goes to Luo, which is good. Are Luos faster in clicking on Luo or good than Kikuyus? That's the question, because of this cognitive dissonance. Now, similarly, you can, and again, the formatting got a little screwed up. I'm sorry, I, I, I messed up the slides. Uh, it should say Kikuyu are good on the left, Luo are bad on the right, on the top one. Again, laughter goes with good. Kikuyu has nothing to do with it. Laughter goes with good. But if the word Kikuyu is next to good, and I'm a Kikuyu, am I faster at clicking that than if I'm a Luo. So that's, this is, we, we base this on IETs that have been done to, to measure racial bias in the US and there's a similar structure. And I'll show you that there, there are gonna be some effects uh, here. So we are gonna be picking up something kind of, kind of interesting. Okay, I wanna get to the results uh, and really get through the results in the next 10 minutes just so we have time for, for questions. Um, more questions. This is a complex lab. There were three different uh, games, dictator game, public good game, choose your dictator game, plus we have the IETs. Um, I mentioned there's anonymous play and then play with co-ethnics and non-co-ethnics. For several of the games, there are multiple different outcomes that have been used in the literature. So for the public goods game, sometimes just people just look at the contribution to the common pot. Um, we, as many other games do, also measure beliefs about how much other people are going to put into the pot. So you might be interested in those beliefs. And then you might be interested in the difference between the two. How much I'm transferring minus my belief. In other words, am I giving more than I think others will? Do I feel like I'm going above and beyond the social norm? Okay, so that's a, that's a whole set of outcomes. We had four different primes. And actually in round two, we introduced a fifth prime. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, well, there was a fourth prime plus the control group. And as in any empirical study, a lot of different statistical choices. Should we look at the difference in averages or the difference in distributions? Sometimes people do one or the other. Which covariates should we use as controls on the right-hand side? Which subgroups should we look at? Men versus women? More versus less educated? By ethnic group? By age? There's a bunch of different subgroups. Should we analyze each game separately or should we pool all the results? And then, given that we're running all these tests, which type of multiple testing adjustment should we use on our p-value? Again, there's multiple ones we could use. So when, once you add up all the possible hypotheses as we did, because we wrote down all these hypotheses, there are just hundreds and hundreds of potential hypotheses. Why is this a problem? This is a problem because when you have hundreds and hundreds of potential hypotheses, you may, if you like, choose to cherry pick a few results that come, come out maybe by chance. You know, out of 100 tests, five are gonna come through statistically significant at 95% confidence by chance. You could pick those out and emphasize those if you don't do the right adjustments the right multiple testing adjustments. So um, the truth is in most social science empirical research, this issue isn't dealt with. We don't really know how many tests were run by the time we see the final paper. It's, 
it's endemic. Um, now in medical trials, starting about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they started dealing with this by forcing medical trial researchers to register their study designs ex ante to try to tie their hands. Of course, in the case of medical trials, pharmaceutical companies were sometimes running lots of trials that the world never heard of until they got a positive result, or at least that's the fear uh, of what was happening. Um, the same thing could be going on in social science. So we registered our pre-analysis plan. I'm going to show you the results from the pre-analysis plan. And because for each of the games, we ran multiple tests. There's a test on treatment one, you know, the political competition prime, the ethnic prime, the national prime, et cetera. I'm going to show you the adjusted p-values for the fact that in a given game, we may have run 15 hypothesis tests. Of course, once you do that adjustment, all your p-values go up. So there will be a bunch of cases where you're going to see what looks like a significant uh, coefficient that after the adjustment is only marginally significant or not significant. At the same time, that's a more credible p-value. It's not just us doing this, although we think this may be the first or one of the first experimental lab studies in economics to do this. A bunch of psychology studies have already done this. But in, in economic experiments, it's rare. But in development economics, field experiments, this is a growing trend. In political science, this is a growing trend. In psychology, this is a growing trend. So um, over the last few years, a number of people have, have adopted this approach. Okay. So what I want to do is really summarize the main results. I'm only going to show you a table or two and maybe a figure um, with those core results. I'm going to mainly go through them and give you the magnitudes here on this slide, um, but we can get into to all the, the, the gory details uh, in the question period. So these are our three questions. What is the degree of coethnic preference in the lab? How does behavior change in an election period, this period of intense political competition? And how is behavior changed by priming? Okay, so what are some answers? So the first question, a very striking pattern in these labs in Kenya, and quite optimistic finding, uh, I would say. There's really no consistent evidence for co-ethnic preference across any of the three games. Despite what I told you about public goods, my own previous research on public goods in Kenya, and the fact that we know ethnic politics is salient in Kenya, when you put people in the lab and you match them with co-ethnics or non-co-ethnics, they don't give more to co-ethnics. Not in this lab. When we look at the IAT, we do find some ethnic bias in the IAT, but it's not huge. It's a fraction of a standard deviation, 0.2 or 0.3 of a standard deviation ethnic bias. So moderate amount of ethnic bias, even in the IAT. How can we make sense of this? Well, a lot of the remaining 10 minutes is going to go into making sense of it, but let me give you an initial take. Um, one uh, implication of the finding is, you know, everyday Kenyans, everyday working class Kenyans, when they're making economic decisions, like dividing up a pie, how much to save, how much to give to somebody else, uh, it doesn't seem that ethnic bias or strong ethnic preferences are really salient in this setting. Maybe ethnic divisions need to be mobilized. We know that politicians mobilize ethnic divisions. We know they organize ethnic militias and they pay people to join those militias, etc. cetera. Um, there may be a real divergence between everyday inter-ethnic cooperation that we see in Nairobi, for the most part, 99.9% .9 of the time, and elite activated ethnic divisions, activated by politicians. Now, one thing to keep in mind, of course, though, is this is a pretty young sample an urban sample, a pretty well-educated sample, maybe there's a generational difference. Maybe 50 and 60-year-olds would show more ethnic bias. Maybe people raised in rural areas where tribal chiefs are still influential, where vernacular languages are still spoken. A lot of these guys growing up in Nairobi don't even speak their own vernacular language. They speak English and Swahili. So maybe this isn't the population where we'd expect to see it, but still, young Slum dwellers in Nairobi are a very politically important population in Kenya. So this is a very interesting result, but it may not generalize to all Kenyan subgroups. Okay, so that's the first result, and I'm going to show you the details in a second. Second, how does behavior change during an election? Remember, our prediction was we'd see a lot more co-ethnic preference or bias in an election. Two findings. First, overall generosity in the dictator game and the public goods game falls dramatically in round two in Kenya. People are much more, much more selfish in the weeks leading up to an election. Maybe it's something about a period of intense competition. Maybe it's uh, you know, the spectacle of politicians running around making promises 
trying to buy votes. People are thinking in, 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 in a bit more selfish terms during this time. Uh, whatever it is, there's a very large drop, about 15% in giving. This is our most empirically robust finding. This finding easily survives the multiple testing adjustments. Even if we account for the fact that in a game we ran 20 tests, this is such a large effect that it survives. It's a very large effect. But people are no more biased for co-ethnics in those periods. So even though they're more selfish, even though they're less altruistic near elections, they're not any more biased towards their co-ethnics. This was the most surprising result for us. The lack of co-ethnic preference in the first Kenyan round, far away from an election, I'm not saying we expected it, but once we found it, we thought, well, maybe that makes sense. Ethnic divisions haven't been activated. But two weeks or three weeks before an election that's being fought on ethnic lines in Kenya, when you put people in the lab and tell them they're playing against someone from a different ethnic group, they still don't give any less to that person. This was a striking finding for us. No, but we're going to get, take two steps out of ten forward, hopefully, in the next few slides. But we haven't, we haven't totally figured out why. I, yeah, that's really where we're at. Um, now, what happens with priming? When we push people's buttons, do they behave differently or not? That's the next, the next question. Um, political competition is sort of our leading prime, in some sense, in the Kenya round. Um, Parallel to the negative effect on giving between round one and round two in Kenya, when you prime people to political competition in the lab, they give a little less. It's not as large as the election effect, the actual round one versus round two effect, but it goes in the same direction, and it's not small. So there's something about political competition, whether in the real world or in the lab, that makes people more selfish. But another striking and unexpected finding came through. When we prime people to national identity, Instead of having them cooperate more across ethnic lines or be more altruistic in general, they become much more selfish. When you remind Kenyans they're Kenyans, they become more selfish in the lab, particularly in round one, particularly far away from the election. This is a bit of a, a puzzling finding, and the IAT, but the IAT is going to shed some light on what's going on here. Okay, so this is just some of the data. What we've done here, and I don't want to get into all the details, we're regressing how much you transfer in the dictator game as a function of different primes. Those are the first three as a function of being election time and then having co-ethnic pairing and non-co-ethnic pairing. Now, <clears throat> let me first mention this election time result. You can see this negative six point something uh, percent effect. Remember, on, in baseline, people are giving 43% of the pie to their partner. That falls by six point something percent in round two in Kenya. It's a huge effect. Very significant, and, and it, 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 even with the multiple testing adjustment, this is the family-wise error rate that deals with the family of hypotheses being tested, p-value is still less than 0.01. This is a very robust finding. And what you can see very clearly is this shift. Uh, the left side is round one, the right side is round two. There's a lot of people at 50-50, the 50-50 split in round one, and not too many at, who give zero to their partner, and you see the shift in round two, a lot more zeros and fewer 50-50. So this is a very typical, these are really the, the most typical modes you see in, in, a, in a dictator game, 0 and 50. There's also another mode, I think, at 40 there. Um, OK. Now, how do we understand the degree of co-ethnic preference? In round one in the Kenya lab, there was an anonymous game played. And then in the identified game, we had people play with co-ethnics only, not with non-co-ethnics. We rem remedied that in the second round where you play with co-ethnics and non-co-ethnics. To get that effect of how much you give to co-ethnics versus non-co-ethnics in this regression, you need to add up A and B, the co-ethnic effect and election time times co-ethnic, that's round two, minus C. Remember, there's no non-co-ethnic pairing outside of election time. There's no equivalent term. So we add A plus B and minus C. What is that difference? It's only minus 1.8, not statistically significant. It's basically a zero. In other words, close to an election in round two, you maybe give one or 2% less to a non-coethnic. Tiny effect that's not statistically significant. It goes in the you know, right direction, but it's very small. So there's no evidence close to elections that you're biased against non-coethnics. Okay, the last effect are the priming effects. You can see the negative point estimates on the national prime and the political competition prime. 
Interestingly, when we talk about ethnicity, we talk about languages and foods and, and different regional, uh, and regional differences, that ethnic prime never has an effect ever on anything. But political competition and national priming both drop, lead to a drop in generosity. Now, neither of those survives the multiple testing adjustment. They have p-values between 0.1 and 0.2. So they're kind of on the margin of significance. But once we take into account that in this table we ran 15 hypothesis tests, they're no longer significant. So we don't want to overplay them, but the magnitudes are interesting and they're suggestive, I would say. We have a drop of three to 4%, not as big as the election time effect, but pretty big. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna just zoom through the remaining results just because I, I, I wanna wrap up in two minutes. We have similar results in the public goods game, similar negative priming effects, but not very robustly significant, similar negative election time effects, not quite significant, and similar differences between co-ethnic groups, if you see what I bracketed, and mixed groups. Again, there are no significant differences between those coefficient estimates. And for the public goods game, we actually ran the co-ethnic versus mixed groups in both round one and round two, and in neither case is there a difference. So you just don't prefer sharing with your co-ethnics relative to a mixed setting. The choose your dictator game, I've already kind of given away the result. This is the coefficient estimate on how much you prefer a co-ethnic. It's positive, so it's the right sign, but the t-statistic is less than one. Again, very weak evidence that maybe you slightly prefer choosing a co-ethnic, but no effect. And that holds even if the person you're playing with knows your ethnicity. So, you know, the way we did it, as I mentioned before, is in the dictator games, they were either anonymous or identified. And there was a choose your dictator game that was either anonymous or identified where I, where I was matched with a dictator that either knew my ethnicity or didn't. That's how these games kind of fit together in the lab. Okay, so what is going on, just to sum up in a couple slides and then to take questions. How do we account for the negative effects of national priming? Why when people think of Kenya or Kenyan, you know, all of these great things of Kenya, uh, do, are, they, are they less cooperative? One thing that we, one comment we've gotten from people who know Kenya well is they say, well, you know, you tried to prime nation, but you really primed ethnicity. So you talked about all the gold medals in the Olympics, but it turns out almost all the gold medals are won by Kalenjins, one ethnic group. So when you tell me about the gold medals, I'm thinking about the, the Kalenjins. I'm not thinking about Kenya. And even the, in the control group, when you prime me, uh, asking me how often I take a minibus, a matatu, all the matatu owners are Kikuyus. So you thought it was neutral, but in fact, you were pressing my ethnic buttons all over. Now, maybe that just speaks to how pervasive ethnicity is in all realms of life or ethnic divisions are, um, but, it, but it would be a limitation to the priming. Um, but we, got, we went to the IAT and we actually find something here. What we find is when we use this ethnic IAT to measure ethnic bias, Kikuyu versus Luo ethnic bias, when we prime people on the nation, we're making them more ethnically biased. <laughs> When we prime people on political competition, we're also making them more ethnically biased. So both of those primes that came through in behavior actually come through in the IAT. That's kind of reassuring. What's interesting is they both come through on the ethnic bias IAT. None of the primes has any effect on the national pride IAT. In general, there's very little measured national prime, pride in that game, in that IAT, and there's no effect of the primes. But on the ethnic one, there is. So these are the results. And again, these, with the multiple testing adjustment, are just borderline significant. Unadjusted, the national prime increases ethnic bias. You can see the, the top row. Same for political competition, even larger. The ethnic prime had no effect. And I'll just very men briefly mention that since we had no effect of the ethnic pri uh, prime in round one, in round two, we introduced what we called the blatant ethnic prime. And this was like the hit you on the head ethnic prime, which was, there are currently 15 cabinet ministers in Kenya. Did you know that, s that eight of them are Kikuyus? Stuff like that. Just really emphasizing that certain groups have power and other groups don't have power. Even that blatant prime had no effect. Now, it could be the case that with these uh, ethnic primes, there is some social desirability going on, that people knew what we were getting at when we were priming ethnicity, and they kind of didn't go there. But that sh they shouldn't be able to get away with it on the IAT. Um, What's that? Where would they go if they got Well, if, if we're pushing ethnic bias, we should capture it on the IAT. It should be hard to hide that implicit bias. That's the theory of the IAT. There you go. There. Okay. Uh, in terms of the national IAT, no effects of any prime. 
It's kind of interesting. So the national IT didn't bias too much, but the national prime didn't affect the national IT. Okay, I'm going to wrap up because I'm already over time, and I'm sure there's questions. I want to get back to this information treatment. So remember, we were planning to send tens of thousands of SMS messages to people talking about how great Kenya was and how everybody should there should be unity and whatnot. After we found all the national priming effects, these negative effects, we decided we didn't want to do that that intervention uh, in ethnically contested regions. Um, so we didn't, we didn't do that. Uh, and once we write up our results, we're actually very interested in sharing some of these results with all the different civil society and government groups doing the messaging, not because our priming is the same as their messaging. They understand the setting better than we do. They, they, they've done their, their marketing campaign. But we still think that our results maybe have something to contribute to, to their thinking. Um, you know, more broadly, there is this question about why the elections were peaceful. Of course, there was all this unity messaging. Maybe the unity messaging was good. Maybe that was the reason why there wasn't violence after, after the elections. You know, maybe our priming results just, just don't link up with reality. When I've, based on the time I've spent in Kenya reading newspapers, also just talking with people in Kenya, especially this past um, this summer when, when I was back in Kenya, I don't think people thought that the unity messages were really that salient or that influential. I think, A, the reason why there probably wasn't violence after another contested election was people really remembered what happened five years earlier. No one wanted a repeat of it, and there was really no hunger for it the way there was before. Second, high-level political officials, especially Raila Odinga, who, was, who you know, got the election stolen from him in 2007, may have gotten the election stolen from him in 2013, the, the, the computer vote count shut down after a couple days with the vote tally very even, and then it restarted with a hand count, and Uhuru Kenyatta won. Now, maybe that hand count was fine, but it's, it's a bit, it's contested again exactly what happened. Raila spoke extremely assertively against any sort of violent protest, uprising. And in 2007 and eight, even though he didn't lead the violence himself, he wasn't as actively speaking against it. So I think that's probably why there wasn't you know, the, same, uh, the same effect. Getting to why we don't find the coethnic preference, you know, we've looked around. There's a couple of recent papers, including some working papers, doing similar things in Uganda, in Malawi, in Zambia. And what's kind of interesting is in these labs, mainly played in urban areas, although I think the Malawi labs were rural too, when you run these same games and you pa pair people with coethnics and non coethnics, you don't find very much evidence of coethnic preference in the lab in any of these settings. Maybe there's something going on in politics with ethnic divisions and ethnic mobilization that just doesn't come through in the lab in this kind of day-to-day -day economic decision-making. So maybe our results shouldn't be that surprising anymore. They're just building on, they're contributing to this new literature. Second, how can we account for the drop in generosity close to elections? You know, is it just the case that in a period of political competition, everybody gets selfish in a period of competition? Uh, maybe. We were a bit surprised because these lab results don't link up with the survey results, our own earlier survey results. There's some new experimental evidence, uh, actually from the US though, and there's an unpublished working paper by Shahar, uh, Shahar Kariv here at Berkeley, who shows that the overall economic environment, the overall social environment really does seep into the lab. So for instance, they ran labs in the months before and the months after the 2008 economic crisis in the US here in Berkeley. They ran standard games. Students at Berkeley were playing very differently a few months after the crisis than a few months before. People were more selfish. People were less generous. So large-scale political or economic events can really affect play in the lab. So in that sense, our results, I think, make sense. OK, so this is the last slide. What have we learned? I think one way to look at this is to say, you know, maybe these lab experiments aren't that useful. We know ethnic politics matter. You're not picking them up. And it's because the measurement tool just isn't adequate. It isn't good enough. The polar opposite response would be to say, well, maybe this conventional wisdom is wrong. You know, maybe there isn't the sort of degree of ethnic bias and preference that we thought was there. Uh, but as I think we've discussed a bit, you can reconcile these views. Ethnicity could matter in different ways in different settings. And day-to-day -day economic transactions, we know in Nairobi people of all ethnic groups are doing business, trading, getting along 99.9% .9 of the time, even if in certain periods ethnic divisions are mobilized. So I, we don't see them as contradictory, but uh, it does raise questions, the results. OK, thanks. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, I'm going to leave you to um, 
manage the Great. questions. Thanks. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so, Chris, um, uh, so you were uh, talking about the uh, You know, <clears throat> I'm not sure, honestly. I know that it's something we need to, to look into more. Of course, we do find some evidence that the priming does shift um, the ethnic IAT. So it, it's not that this was such a toothless priming exercise that, that, that sort of nothing came, came through. Uh, but I think, um, as I mentioned, we're already an interdisciplinary team, but we, we, we're, we need to bolster our, I think, our understanding of the psychology literature on this. And... Um, we are doing something a little unconventional, right? I mean, you know, we, I think IETs were developed to measure latent views that were meant to be sort of fixed latent views, but we're trying to manipulate them. So I think this is your question. Of, does it make any sense to think that, that priming would do anything? And um, uh, I, we, we have to do more work on that. So thanks for the question. Yeah. I think it's, it's a great question, and um, it's not one that we, uh, you know, c grapple with here. The, um, basically, in the Kenyan case, the creation of different ethnic identities was, was a colonial project. There, were, there was a lot of ethnic diversity and clan diversity and regional diversity, but also cross-ethnic alliances historically among different groups. Um, you know, there were group names that were literally invented by the British. The Luya didn't exist. The British invented them. They just clustered groups that lived near each other and said, you guys are all Luya. You know, the people who lived there didn't think of themselves as members of the same ethnic group. They do now, though. So in some ways, this, like you said, project had long-run uh, long impacts. I think for us, we can make, in, uh, we want to make intellectual pro progress in the context of contemporary Kenya, knowing that just last election, there really was violence along ethnic lines around an election we were studying the same sort of divide before this election. And I think what's striking is despite the high level conflict at the micro level in everyday economic decision making or everyday decision making, we don't find evidence of this, these kinds of divides. And so in terms of speaking to the origins, maybe it speaks to the origins being elite level and you know, mobilized, manipulated elite level divides to some extent and not necessarily pervasive ethnic hatred. I think there's this kind of view in the media or this kind of you know, view that there are ancient ethnic hatreds that led to the genocide in Rwanda or led to other violence in East Africa. And that goes against the kind of our findings, which would be, you know, in most settings, people really didn't care very much. Again, this is a younger, urban, more educated population, but, but I think that's the, the, the sort of hopeful finding, even if there's been this long history of high-level manipulation and group creation and group rivalry. Um, so... I, I'm not answering your question as much as saying we're looking at a different layer of the puzzle and finding a, a kind of optimistic pattern. That would be my, my point. Way in the back. 
Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Yeah, I, I guess it's a, it's a question of one's prior belief about what would happen and um, how much we think these ethnic biases would show up in the lab. So even if we think that people often cooperate, we might think when given the choice in the lab, they might still prefer one of their own, you know, maybe, but, but yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, thanks for the point. The, the choose your dictator game was an attempt to get at sort of at this and saying, like, okay, who do I want to kind of split a pie with? You know, who's going to be better to me? That's why it's called choose your dictator. But um, uh, I don't disagree with anything you said in the sense that our results suggest that these really are different spheres. And I, it's kind of interesting to think that there's a sort of micro local sphere where ethnic bias and ethnic preferences are kind of minimal even if in the national political sphere they're they are they're operationalized they're active organization is along ethnic lines and we, we had survey evidence i didn't even bring it in here where we asked these guys whom they voted for in the previous election and just as you'd predict people vote overwhelmingly voted overwhelmingly along ethnic lines so it's clear that they are voting co-ethnically but in a whole range of, of different decisions in the lab, it doesn't come through. So I think, if nothing else, maybe this sort of ties a ribbon around the fact that these really are different spheres. And we shouldn't think that, even in a place that had ethnic violence a few years ago, in the middle of this contested political campaign with ethnic code words being used in rallies to rally the faithful, even in that setting, we're not seeing that bias filter into the lab. And so um, we were surprised by that. You may not have been, but but I think it's... Um, it, it's it, it'll sh it shifted our priors a little bit. I would say, yeah. Yeah. You know, there there have been a few labs recently um, that are similar. Um, there have been some labs I know of in Indonesia. There have been labs in other, in other settings. I think this is still um, a relatively new literature. I mean, I think we could sum summarize the sort of, you know, development literature in, in, in a handful of, of studies. And I think what's striking is the, the, the ones that are coming in are kind of going against the, the view that you would find the spies. I, I know a little bit about the Indonesia study. There's something very interesting in the Indonesia study, which doesn't quite go in the same way as our finding, but, it, but it's similar, which is in Indonesia, if you prime people to national identity, most Indonesians react negatively. They're less generous, except for Javanese. So the Javanese, who are sort of the elite in Indonesia, you know, Jakarta is, in, you know, is sort of in their island. Uh, for them, if you prime them to national identity, they're more generous, but all other Indonesians are less generous. So you know, even in some other settings, there's this, at least for, in some cases, negative national priming effects. If people aren't bought into the national program, if you remind them of, uh, of the nation or try to cultivate national pride, it may backfire. So, so there, there's a whole IET literature, priming literature uh, in the United States. There's plenty of evidence in the lab for, for racial bias in the United States as well. But that's sort of like the biggest literature. But in, in terms of develop, developing countries or low-income countries, I think it's a new literature. That's my, my understanding. Yeah. 
Hmm. It might. I mean, I, in general, getting you know a broader cross section would be useful. I'd be curious to do something like this in rural areas. Um, you know, particularly the couple of provinces where there has been ethnic conflict. I mean, I think if we went right to the source and you know, Rift Valley province where there's been round after round of ethnic violence and had people play with anonymous Kalenjins, and, you know, Kalenjins and Kikuyus mainly. That that would be a pretty interesting setting in, in Kenya. But um, we have no plans right now. <laughs> no no funding right now. I'm really sorry. <laughs> this is such a great conversation, but we're going to have to wrap up because other people want this one. But presumably we can kind of linger in the back great. while. Thank you. We can get dismantled. So thank you so much. Thanks.